pew Bible in front of you. It's page number 858. If you have one of those gift Bibles, it's page number 768. And uh, that's not a joke. That's to help you. If you, you say, well, I'm not super comfortable, so I don't want to try to open the Bible. Well, we'd love for you to see the words yourself. So again, in the pew Bibles, the ones that are black in front of you in the pew, they're page 858. And if you have one of those gift Bibles out of a gift bag, it's page 768. We'd love for you to see the words for yourself. Amen. And uh, you don't have to take my word for it. You can see it for yourself because uh, I'm wrong a lot. Just ask my wife. She'll back it up. All right. Mark chapter five. Uh, well, again, I do want to take time while you're turning there to just say thank you to our first responders, those that serve our community. You truly are real heroes. And you may not think of yourself like that. You probably don't want to hear somebody say that you're a hero. And uh, but in the time of need, you're there. And that's important. I tried to figure out exactly how many first responders we had in America and 2001 or 2021, 2020, it's hard to get that real good number with the way things are going. So I got, I, I found in 2019, so these, these numbers are two years old, but I wanted to see what, what we had, or at least kind of a, a good guess. I guess it's a good guess now. It's not really a factual numbers, but in 2019, I found out we have more than a million firefighters in our country, but get this, with more than 750,000 being volunteers. Thousand being volunteers. That means they're all out of the kindness of their heart. They're not getting that paycheck and things like that for it. Uh, police and law enforcement have 556,000 full-time employees with 436,000 sworn-in personnel in other capacities. The sheriffs have 291,000 full-time workers and an additional 186,000 sworn-in personnel. There are 155,000 nationally registered EMTs. Praise the Lord. I've needed an EMT a few times. I won't get, well, I might tell you those stories. We'll see how the day goes. I don't like to tell them because they're embarrassing, but uh, that's typically how you end up in an ambulance is something embarrassing. But that's amazing. It's almost hard to wrap my mind around those numbers, the amount of people that serve our country. And so, again, I want to say to those that serve our community and our, the surrounding communities, thank you so much for what you do. Uh, you, you are appreciated by this church. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's uh, read the passage this morning. Uh, we like to stand in honor of God's word here at Peakview Baptist Church. Uh, we stand for the flag. We stand for the word of God. We just stand for anything we really respect. Amen. Amen. And uh, if you don't, if you're not, uh, you know, healthy enough to stand, if you have problems, we understand you can sit down. It's not a big deal. Uh, but we just like to out of respect and reverence for the word of God. Mark chapter five, and we'll begin reading in verse 21, verse 21. The Bible says, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people were gathered unto him. And he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter, believe it, or, my little daughter, lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and, shall, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. That means crowded him, surrounded him. And a certain woman which had a blood, an issue of blood twelve years, and suffered many things of physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the present, or pressed behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in, in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee. Why sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that she that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what, what was done in her, meaning she, she knew she was healed, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house a certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. 
So now somebody came from Jairus' house, one of his servants, and said, Your daughter's dead. Why troublest the ma thou the master any further? Verse 36, And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he sa saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. He saw the people mourning the death of this little girl. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why makest ye, make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but asleep, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Verse 42, And straightway the damsel arose, the little girl got up, and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished. With a great astonishment, let's pray one more time. We'll get into the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would bless this time we have together. Lord, speak to our hearts through your Word. Uh, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, we ask that today uh, you'd convict their hearts that they need to be saved and, and, and how to get saved, give them the courage to uh, receive that knowledge, Lord. And, and uh, Lord, for the rest that are saved, we ask that you'd help us to be convicted uh, by your, really your example that you've left for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I've titled my message this morning, Jesus, the first first responder. <laughs> Jesus, Amen. the first first responder. Uh, my first knowledge of the police, <laughs> first responders in general, I guess, would have, would have been when I was a little kid. And I learned in school about this amazing ability of dialing 911. Some of y'all know where I'm already going with this. <laughs> Don't jump the story. <laughs> I remember getting home and talking to my little brother about it and explaining to him, because he was younger than me, he hadn't learned yet, this amazing ability of picking up the phone and dialing 911, and somebody would come and help you if you needed them. And then I convinced him to do it. <laughs> you see how smart I was? Don't do it yourself. Plausible deniability. I never touched the phone. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so anyways, he picks up the phone, and, and I'm not that old, so it was still, we, we had cordless home phones. Don't think I'm, I'm, you know, none of that. Some of the younger generation has no idea what I just did. They're just like, what is he talking about? We had a cordless home phone, and he picked up this cordless home phone, and he dialed 911, call, and he put it to his ear. Of course, I'm standing there watching. And I hear words coming on the other end. I can't really make them out. And he just looks serious and goes, click, boom, and puts it back down. And I thought, oh, well, whatever. And so we run off and continue on being kids. Probably already forgot about it. But a few minute, moments later, somebody comes knocking on our door. Now, if you have kids in the home, you know this. Or if you've had kids in the home, when somebody knocks on the door, rings the doorbell. We didn't have a doorbell, so it was a knock on the door. Uh, it's like, it, it, it like calls the masses. From dogs to cats to animals to everybody wants to know who's at the door. So, of course, we all flood into the living room and we're, you know, I, some of us are looking through the window. Some of us are trying to get through the door where my mom opens it and there's a police officer standing in our porch. And I, to be honest, I ran away. I don't know what else happened. I'm assuming my mom found out that there was a 911 call from this address. And so, they, of course, they came and investigated. And I learned something very important about uh, dialing 911 that day is if you call, they will come. If you call, they will come. And I'm very thankful for that. Very thankful for that. I'm very thankful that there are men and women ready to jump into fires or jump into danger for us whenever we need it. They are ready to serve. And in our passage, we see Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is also ready to serve and help people when they need Him. Look back at the passage. I'm going to kind of just tell the story uh, quickly in my terms, and which are sometimes a little weird, but just bear with me. I'm going to tell the story, and then we'll kind of get into some preaching. You say, isn't all this preaching? It's not preaching until I get the blood vessels going in my neck and stuff like that, so just bear with me. 
So Jesus arrives on, he pulls up on a boat to this shore, and he's actually still on the boat, and a big group of people arrive. This is what we read. Big, large crowd arrives and is waiting for him at the shore. His popularity, because he's been doing miracles and things in his life, in his young ministry, his popularity is growing, and people are waiting to get a hold of him, because he's feeding thousands of people with, with a, a kid's lunch, and he's healing people that have had diseases, and healing people that are blind, and healing people that can't walk, and he's casting demons out of people that you wouldn't think it'd be possible for it to happen. And so people are really excited to see him. And so they, they gather around and he gets off the boat and the, and the first man to really speak to him, aside from just all the crowd maybe trying to get his attention, is a man named Jairus. Now if I say Jairus or Jairus, I mean the same guy. I'm sorry, I've heard it said both ways. And sometimes when something's said one way, it sticks in your head. Like my name is Stephen, but it's spelled with a V so you can't misspell or say that. But then you have those guys with the PH, the biblical way, and it's like Stephen or Stephen or, you know, and it's like, don't get confusing how are you supposed to say So I've heard it said both ways. If I say it weird, um, excuse me, I'm, I'm dumb. And uh, so anyways, Jesus uh, gets approached by this man named Jairus and he falls down before him and he starts to pray and beg and ask him, come heal my daughter. She's 12 years old and she's about to die. What a moment of distress, by the way. You just saw my daughter. You just saw her. I would try to move heaven and earth if I had to say, try to save her life. The thought of losing a child is probably one of the most painful things I could think about. And uh, so this man, broken, comes to Jesus, says, can you please come? And Jesus, of course, agrees. And so Jesus starts following this man to his house. So as he's walking, of course, the crowd hasn't dispersed. Uh, this guy is celebrity at this point. So he's crowded around. People are thronging him. People are touching him. People are messing with him. And people are trying to call out to him. People are asking him for things. And he's, he's on a mission. And then all of a sudden, a woman who is uh, described as having a blood issue. We don't know exactly what that issue was, but it wasn't good. It obviously was uh, debilitating. She is, for 12 years, spent all her money going to doctors, suffering, by the way, it's saying that, which means they tried some crazy stuff, some, some draconian methods of healing her blood issue that didn't work. In fact, it just made it worse. She's probably at the point where she's ready to give up. She has no more money to pay anybody else. She doesn't have the health to go travel to find somebody else. She, she's literally living on the streets at this point, uh, living off of people's handouts. And so she, she sees Jesus and thinks in her heart and in her mind, if I can just touch His clothes, I can be healed. I've heard what this man Jesus can do. And so she, from the back, she doesn't approach Him from the front. She's very scared. She's very nervous. Uh, of course, she was kind of an outcast of society as it was because if you were a diseased person, uh, they didn't have the knowledge of knowing if you were somebody that would spread it to other people. If you were infectious, they didn't know. So they treated you like a kind of an outcast. And so she sneaks in through the back of the crowd and she gets down and she just gets a hold of just part of his garment. It doesn't say she wrapped his legs up or she just touches some of his clothes, maybe the hem of his garment. And instantly Jesus feels the virtue go out of him, meaning he knew exactly what happened. That's just how the Bible describes it. You say, well, what does that exactly mean? I don't really know. Sorry. You can blame my church for hiring me. Um... <laughs> He said, the preacher's supposed to know, right? I, I studied it. It's, there's nothing clear that I can make sense of to explain to you how he knew his virtue went out of him. And immediately she feels she's healed. She knows she is. I mean, it'd be like, you know, if you had a broken leg and then all of a sudden, boom, it's straight. Now, obviously, this is a blood issue. I don't know how she knew and she just felt good again. She felt healthy again. She felt right. Uh, who knows? Maybe even just she saw her skin and her complexion change right in front of her eyes. I mean, imagine if she's just healed and so she's trembling, nervous, and then Jesus, she thinks she's done. I mean, Jesus is walking. She barely touched his clothes. She's not thinking anything of it. He's going to continue walking to help this young girl. And then all of a sudden, he stops. Busted. <laughs> and he, he says, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? And of course, the disciples, the Bible says the disciples are like, Jesus, you're being thronged. You're being crowded by a big group of people. What do you mean? Who touched me? That's like, if you like football, if you don't, sorry, this illustration won't connect with you. But it's like, if you like football and you see a running back run up in, in, like in the line of scrimmage and just everybody from the defense is tackling and the offense is pushing and it's just a big pile and then it ends. It'd be like the running back getting up and saying, who grabbed my thigh? Which one of you, Grandma? Everybody'd be like, dude, what are you talking about? You were in a pile of men. He was in a pile of people. And so for him to ask, who touched me, it's kind of crazy. So he starts looking around. Oh, I got to imagine Jesus has those penetrating eyes. Like he can see your soul because he could. Uh, he can see right through you because he could. It's kinda, the, the only thing I could think that's similar to that would be like my mom. She seemed like when we were in trouble, 
which one of you did it? And then those piercing eyes would cross over me and my three siblings, and it'd be like, she sees my soul, and it hurts. And so she, he starts gazing around, and the woman's trembling, and she's scared. She doesn't know what's going to happen, but she says, I might as well just fess up. So she fesses up down on the ground in front of her. She says, Jesus, it was me that touched you, but I'm healed now. I touched just your clothes, and so suddenly, I'm all better. I can't even explain it, but I'm better. I just believed in my heart that if I could touch your clothes, I'd be better. And Jesus says to her in verse 34, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Basically saying, it was your faith. It wasn't just the fact that I'm Jesus Christ. It was that you believed that I could do what you thought I could do. That made you whole. Go in peace. You'll no longer, you'll, she'll never have that plague again. She'll never have a blood issue again. She's healed for good. Awesome. So then he continues to go. And uh, he decides, alright, we're getting close to the house. Uh, I just need the Father... Jairus, and I'm picking three disciples, kind of his, his closer inner circle of guys that followed him. He had 12 guys that followed him all the time, but he had three that were closer than the rest. You, you, you know what I mean. He said, I've got 12 friends, but three of them are like my best friends. You know what I mean? It's like, these are the closest. So he says, James, John, Peter, y'all are coming with me. Come with James. They go into the house of this man, Jairus, and uh, they get in there and everybody inside the house. So this man was a wealthy man. He had servants. He had, he had money. He had people that he knew. He had people that may have been praying for his daughter. Other Pharisees, other religious people that were there praying over his daughter. They're all there crying. Wailing is really what the Bible describes. Just weeping. Of course, any time. Uh, death, is, death is terrible no matter what. doesn't matter if somebody's in their 90s. Death is terrible. But there is something that is extra tragic when it's a child. It just it hurts your heart something different. Because it's not just that they died after living their life. It's they never got to live a life. You know, and so uh, everybody's wailing. And Jesus walks in and says, what, what's, this, what's this big to do? Why is everybody crying? She's not dead. She's just asleep. Now, I understand that they didn't have all the medical advancements that we get to take advantage of today. But they knew how to check a pulse, probably, and figure out if somebody's breathing. They had glass they put over the mouth or something, see if there's any breath, you know, all the tricks. They had some trick. And so they begin to laugh him to scorn, is what the Bible says. Now, I don't believe his mother, the mother of this little girl, is laughing. I don't believe Jairus is laughing. And I know the three disciples aren't laughing, but everybody else is laughing him to scorn. Maybe some of the other religious people there, they're like, this dude is crazy. We know dead when we see dead. This guy's nuts. And so they begin to laugh at him and so Jesus says alright everybody out except for my three disciples and the parents he goes, into the, he goes into where the little girl is laying and I mean there's the corpse of a 12 year old girl which means it's not that big and it's and, and, and we don't know how long she was dying she may have even in her death looked like terrible and Jesus takes the hand of this little girl and he says damsel arise basically get up Boom, instantly, life back in her. She sits up, she gets up, she walks. And of course, she walks out of the house and now everybody's astonished. And Jesus' fame spreads abroad because of that. And it's just, it's an incredible story. But let me encourage you, this is not just a story. It's not something I made up. It's not something that never happened. This actually happened about 2,000 years ago. This, the real man, Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, came in the flesh, lived a perfect and sinless life, and actually did what we just read. Now, as I explain... The story, I think in my head as I was reading this, I mean, it's almost like Jesus is the first of the first responders. So what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm going to break that down for you. First, a first responder is ready to help whenever necessary. I am so glad there is not a time limit on 911. I don't know if you've ever had to call like a phone company or something or the internet company or whatever, and you dial them up. Do do do. We're sorry. You reached us outside of our normal business hours. Please call again. You know, and you're like, oh. And you know, even when you call during the business hours, you're not going to actually get through to anybody anyway. You're going to talk to some machines, and then you're going to talk to somebody in India who's trying to pretend. They're like, hello, my name is John. I'm like, no, your name's not John. Don't lie to me now. I need some truth here. And, and, but, but here's the thing 911, there's no time limit. It doesn't matter if it's day, night, weekends. When you call, they come. Jesus was ready to help whenever he was needed. Now, we didn't read all of chapter 5. It would have taken us even longer. Uh, but briefly, uh, to give you some information, he was just on the other side of this lake, like body of water, and he healed a man that had 2,000 demons indwelling him. Or at least we, we're guessing about 2,000 demons. We know this because when he casted out the demons, they went into a herd of pigs that was about 2,000 in number, and they all ran off a cliff. He has been busy doing ministry. This lake is not big enough that you can get on the lake and be 
sleeping for eight, ten hours. No, they, they see the boat coming across the water. He has been busy, busy, busy doing ministry. As he arrives on this shore, maybe he's hungry, maybe he's tired, and it does not matter because he got the, if I can say it like this, the 911 call. Jesus, I need your help. Jesus, I, I, I need you. I need you now. Jesus is still ready to help right now. You say, well, I don't know Jesus, so what are you talking about? Well, as a believer, and what I mean by a believer, a saved person, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I did that when I was 15 years old. I know that I can call on Jesus anytime. In fact, that's usually the first person I call on. Because He's always ready to help me. Uh, but more particularly, He's ready to help with your spiritual needs. Jesus Christ died on the cross, paying for the sins of all mankind. And today, if you don't know Him as your personal Savior, if, you, if you're not 100% sure that if you died right now that you would go to heaven, Jesus is ready to help you right now, today, in this service. He can, he can show you, and we can show you from the Bible, what Jesus did to die for you so that you can be saved. So first, a first responder is willing to help whenever. Praise the Lord for that. By the way, I'm not. I'm not a first responder. Don't call me at 2 in the morning if you have a problem. I'm just kidding. <laughs> My church member knows that's not true. Second, a first responder is willing to help anyone in need. Anyone in need. Now, I'm so glad that when you call 911 that there's not like this questionnaire you've got to like answer. Could you imagine? 911, what's your emergency? I shot myself in the leg. Hang on, you shot yourself? Yes, I shot myself. Well, it sounds like you're kind of dumb. You, uh, you don't meet the criteria for somebody helping you. Sorry, hang up. Hello? Yes, I was cooking in the fire, and I started a grease fire, and my house is now on fire. You started the fire? Oh, sorry, we don't help then. No, no, no. That's not the way it goes down. What's your emergency? You tell them. I shot myself. I started a fire. Whatever it is, I'm hurt. Help comes. Jesus is willing to help anyone in need. Now, these two people that got helped in this passage, and the reason I picked this passage, and I like this passage, is because in one little time frame, you have two different people that are very, very different getting helped. So what do you mean? Well, here's the obvious stuff. I don't want to dig too deep. We don't have time to dig too deep. Um, but here's the obvious stuff that makes them different. He was a man. She was a woman. Without getting into it too much, women were viewed differently in that day. It's just how it was. You didn't approach men, you didn't talk to men, you didn't get treated as men. It wasn't equality, there wasn't equal rights, none of that stuff. And so the fact that Jesus was willing to help a man and a woman, both, is pretty impressive. He was given a name. We know who he is. He's Jairus. He's the ruler of a, a leader in the synagogue. He's a rich and wealthy and powerful man that everybody knew in town. He would have been a community leader as well. Everybody knows Jairus. This woman is not even given a name. Nobody knows who she is. We don't know. We know that she's poor. She spent all her money trying to fix the blood issue. There's no mention of family. Jairus has a family. He has a wife and at least one child. This woman is not said that she is anybody. He is accepted by the community. She is not because of her disease. He was a religious person. It doesn't say that she was at all. They are vastly different people. And yet, Jesus was willing to help the poor woman as much as the rich man. Because, like a first responder, Jesus is willing to help anyone. I think of Acts 10.34, it says this, then Peter, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. What that means, and that was actually a legal term that they used. Back in this time, in, in biblical times, a judge would make their decisions based on people's appearance. Oh, he's my buddy. I like him, so he's not, a, he's not guilty. Yeah, if you think our system's corrupt and, and unjust now, you just go back then. If you weren't liked, if, if the judge thought you were ugly that day, he was a respecter of persons. He could just say, he's guilty because I don't like the way he looked at me. I don't, he's not my friend, but if you're, he's my friend, so he's not guilty. That's what the term came from, respecter of persons. What, what, uh, what Peter said was, God is not a respecter of persons. He's not looking at you going, oh, well, they did this, and they did that, or they said this, or they looked this way. No, 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 God does not care who you are, what you're like, what your status is in life, what your situation is in life. He is willing to help anyone in need. Amen. Jesus, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died for you too. 
He is ready for you to call on Him as your personal Savior. And He's willing to forgive your sins and make you acceptable before God. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not, rich or poor, man or woman, child or, or young or old. No matter what, Jesus will help you today if you're willing to call on Him. So first, it's a first responder and Jesus. They're willing to help whenever. They're willing to help whoever. Third, a first responder helps regardless of how they are treated. I'm glad that the men and women of law enforcement that are still serving our community, despite the fact that many places in our country, they are being mistreated and spoken ill of. And in fact, it was really what started First Responders Day at our church last year through all of the, the 2020 riots and things and the defund the police movement. And it bothered me so much that people that served and sacrificed that they would get treated that way that I said, OK, I don't know what we can't we can't change the world, but we can change right here and we can make sure they know we're loved. And that's the reason we started First Responders Day. And I'm so glad that there are still people that regardless of how they're treated, still are willing to help and love and care for people. When Jesus showed up at Jairus' house and he told them that the, the little girl was only asleep, they laughed him to scorn. Now, that's a strong word in Bible times. We don't use it. I don't say, oh, I was laughing them to scorn, brother. We don't use that term today. Uh, but really, it's a very insulting, kind of trying to humiliate somebody kind of laugh. Let me try to illustrate it for you. Because if somebody laughs me to scorn, I'm not helping you. Here's the example I'll give. Say I'm driving down the road. I see a man on the side of the road with a flat tire. I use a man specifically for this because, well, I'll just see in a minute. And I get, out of the, I get out of my truck and I go over and I see he's got a flat tire. I say, hey, what's going on? He says, I got a flat tire. I say, well, if you have a spare, I can, I can fix that. I can change that for you. And he starts laughing at me. There's no way you could fix my tire. I mean, look at you. There, what do you weigh? About a buck sixty? There's no way you're going to be able to change my tire. You don't look like you know what you're doing at all. And he starts laughing at me. Have, good luck, bro. Bye. That's me, because I'm human. Maybe I'm the only one carnal enough to think that. Now, if it was a woman, I'd probably put up with the scorn just to try to help, because it's a woman. You say, well, that's your sexist. No, I just hope that somebody would do that for my own wife or my own daughter when she's driving. That's just, it's just, you say, what about your son? If you don't know how to change a tire, I failed my, my son as a father. <laughs> Anyways, and they laugh me to scorn. I'm leaving. Good luck. Best wishes. I can pray for you. Apparently, I can't change a tire. You want me to pray for you? And I'd leave. Jesus was undeterred by the way they treated him. Today you may be thinking that what I'm saying sounds good. Like, okay, if this guy Jesus really did live, and if he really was a son of God, and if he really was a, a, a sinless man, and if he really, you, you mentioned dying on the cross, but if, you, if he really did die for my sins, and he's really willing to save me, that's all great and good, but you don't know. I've rejected Jesus all my life. I've rejected God all my life. I've claimed to be an atheist at certain times. I've claimed that I don't love God. I've claimed that he doesn't exist. I've done all of that. And even still, Jesus is ready to help you. By the way, Satan's still in the sound system. Yeah. He is working hard today. <laughs> Heaven and hell are still in the balance, but Jesus is ready to save you. And fourth, and lastly, we're almost done. See, we're doing good. Some of y'all started sweating when I read that big passage. My church knows I can take two verses and stretch them out for 50 minutes. So, <laughs> Fourth, first responders are there in your times of desperation. This didn't happen to me, but I've talked to the man that it happened to, and he, uh, he, he wasn't a youth pastor, but his brother was a youth pastor, and his sister-in-law was pregnant, and they had a two-year-old son, and they were all coming back from camp, and they were riding in a big bus, and he was driving, the man I, I know, he was driving the car for the bus driver. He was driving the bus driver's car, so he's behind it. Brakes give out on the bus, not even three miles from the church, and Rex rolls the bus, and uh, immediately he gets out, his two-year-old nephew is, is on the ground outside of the bus, flung from the bus. He picks him up and he said, as soon as I picked him up, I began to regret what I had just done, picking him up. And then he began to cry. And he said, there's only a few times where, you, where a cry is a good thing to hear. And when a baby's first born and in a situation, a two-year-old like that, he said, I was so happy to hear her cry. And he, he said, I call 911. And of course, 911's on the way. And I, we start kind of going through it. And he says, I'm watching these first responders and I'm so lost. He said, it was like a surreal moment. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, I, I didn't know where to be. He said, it was a time of desperation that I couldn't explain. And yet, here are all these people, hands on deck. They're loving they're caring. They're putting their arms around us. They're doing their triage. They, 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 he said, they were there in a time I needed them most. And it was terrifying. By the way, I, I'm not trying to be dark, but his, his brother did die. 
His sister-in-law, pregnant, did die. And one other person from that crash died. His two-year-old nephew did live, or two at the time. I'm glad that there are men and women in law enforcement and men and women in fire and rescue and men and women who are EMTs who, who show up and they know what to do in a time of desperation. I, I personally, I've not been in too many times of desperation. I, I mean that with a lot of joy in my heart that I've never gone through serious things. I've never had to call an ambulance. I've, I've had ambulances called on me uh, and that's the only experiences I've had. You say, well, what happened? What happened? Well, I'll tell you, it's very simple. I lost in a fight is what that one was. The one I'm thinking of when I was in sixth grade, I got hit into a wall real hard. And I guess I just knocked me out. That was one of the times I woke up in the newest ambulance in town, by the way. I remember seeing the ambulance the rest. Of, hey, I rode in that one. Anyways, but I, I, I personally have never had to go through anything very serious. So I don't want to pretend that I have. But imagine being, I, I can imagine at least being gyrus for just a moment. I have a daughter. She's not near 12 yet, thank the Lord. <laughs> but I could imagine knowing she's going to die. And, I've, and I can imagine calling the other religious people I know and them praying over her and me praying over her, calling the doctors. And I have money. I can pay doctors and having them come. And they said there's nothing we can do. And I can imagine the hopelessness and the helplessness of feeling like she's dead. And, there's, and I don't know if there's anything worse than as a parent knowing you can't do anything. I don't know. But, but Jairus was in desperation. This woman, who's not named, she's spent all her money. She has suffered and suffered for 12 years. She, she's probably living on the streets now because there's no mention of any family here. And she's at a point where she's like, my life is over. I'm going to die. There's nothing I can do. There's nobody that can help me. And she's in a time of desperation. And there Jesus was. Amen. Just when they needed them. As a saved person, I, I'm so glad that when I need Jesus, I can pray and ask Him for anything, no matter how scary the situation is. He will be there for me. The, the only thing that I can kind of think is a time of desperation in my life, and it was a spiritual desperation. I want to be clear, I wasn't in any physical danger, but I was 15 years old, and I had gone to a youth uh, conference, and that's where uh, about probably thousands of teenagers get together at this church in Oklahoma City and uh, just have good preaching, good fun, and it was a great time. And I just remember that, that, that week, the, the three days that we were there, realizing that if I died right now, I'm going to hell. If I die in the condition I'm in, I'm going to hell. And I remember the desperation. And I remember after my, pa my, my youth pastor, he gave a, a devotional. It's just like a Bible study thing at the end of the night with all of us youth group. And I remember going up to him and saying, I've got to talk to you. And he thought I was mad. <laughs> he thought I was going to tell him that I had a problem with him. And I got, we get outside the hotel room and, and I tell him, I said, I got to get saved. So he takes me to the church van and there I remember bowing my head. And, and, and at that point, I, I, I thought I was saved. I knew what to do to get saved. I just ne had never done it. And he says, well, you know what to do. Just do it. And so I bowed my head and I prayed and I asked the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I asked him to save me. And that very moment, I cannot explain the burden that was lifted off my shoulders and the moment of distress that was gone. And by the way, that burden being lifted is your sins being forgiven of uh, just right off your sin, off your shoulders. I, I'll never forget when my, when my now wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, when I had taken her home after church on a Wednesday night and I'm sitting in my room watching probably sports center or something and she texted me and said, I think I need to get saved. I remember the, taking her the next day. I was, I was a teenager and I didn't want to mess it up. So the next day I took her to my pastor's house and I showed up to my pastor's house. And so my pastor's wife took my, my, my wife to, the, to a room in the back of their house and I sat there next to my pastor as my wife was led to the Lord and where she did essentially what I just told you I did. And, and I remember those moments of desperation going, if I die like I am now, I'm splitting hell wide open. And that scared me to death. I knew I wasn't going to go to sleep if I didn't get that thing settled. I remember thinking, I need Jesus and nothing I can do can get me out of this. That's still the reality today. Nothing you can do can earn or work your way out into heaven. You say, well, I'm trying to be a good person. I'm trying to love my wife. I'm trying to serve my community. I'm trying to get, be a good person to, so that hopefully when I die, my good outweighs my bad. Well, I, I don't want to be, I'm not trying to be rude, but it's never going to work. That's 
It's never going to work. I'm sorry to tell you that. Here's what the Bible says. If you would like to turn there, it's, it's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You don't have to, but I'll read it to you. If, but it's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 if you want to write it down find it later. It says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is important, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You need to understand, if we can work our way to heaven, Jesus Christ never had to die on the cross. He never had to raise from the dead. He never had to conquer sin and Satan and death. He didn't have to do that. If we can work our way, but because we can't, He did all that. He is, it's like He has extended the gift. I, many of you got a gift today, and I give a gift to any first-time visitors. And it's, like I'm, it's like Jesus is holding out the bag going, I have your salvation here, and you just need to receive it. You need to accept it. Jesus is waiting for you to call on Him for help in your time of desperation. Jesus was a lot like a first responder, and I hope you see that today, or I hope you see that today. Uh, so today, let me encourage you, and we're about done. Whether you're a first responder or not, no matter who you are today, young, old, religious, not religious, poor, rich, call on Jesus today if you don't know Him as your personal Savior. The Bible says that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the, glo the glory of God. I hope I don't have to sit here and labor on the fact that we all sin. You say, well, I'm not a bad sinner. I haven't done this, this, or this. Well, the Bible talks about if you're guilty of one commandment, of being guilty against one commandment, you've been guilty of them all. You've, you've, you've done them all. We're all sinners. And because we're sinners, we have to be punished. God can't let our sin into heaven. Heaven is a perfect place. It is a just place. It is a righteous place. We don't get to go if we're sinners. And so what Jesus did was Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't have to pay that penalty. We don't have to go to hell because Jesus paid it for us. It would be like you deserve to go to prison for 50 years for something you did and somebody else saying, I'll serve your 50 years so you don't have to. That'd be quite a gift. Now you can still go serve that 50 years if you'd like, but you don't have to. And you, you can, if you so choose, you can say, well, I'd rather just go to hell and see what it's like. You have that free will choice to do that, but I'm begging you, you, you don't understand. It's not, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be a place of party. It's not going to be some red-horned, tailed guy that's laughing and mocking. It's going to be a place of suffering, and we don't want anyone to go there. Amen. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were sinners and wicked and didn't believe in God, didn't know God, he still died for us. And since he paid the penalty, he has provided a free gift of salvation to everyone. It just has to be received by us. <clears throat> Romans 10 uh, verse 9 says that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and, be and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 10 says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I want to, I want to stop this and go back to the, to the passage for just a second. In verse 34, Jesus said, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Because you believe that if you touch me, you'd be healed, that's why you're healed. He tells Jairus when everybody, whenever the man comes and says, Your daughter's already dead, leave Jesus alone, don't bother him, she's dead. He tells Jairus, Be not afraid, only believe. That's all you have to do to be saved today is believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sins. Believe that you can't get to heaven yourself and ask Him to save you. And it's that simple. You say, hey, it can't be that simple. It can't be that easy. It, the Bible talks about how you have to come to, to God as a child. You know what? A child doesn't typically have pride. They're relying on people all their life. They have no problem believing in somebody else doing something for them. But you see, we, we, we've gotten older and we've gotten cynical and the world's made us cynical and we think there's got to be a catch, there's got to be something. It, uh, Brother Kirk and I said, no good deed goes undone. There's got to be a problem here. There's, the, there's no way. No, it really is that simple today. Right. Amen. We're just moments from having what we call an invitation. Now, that's a, it's a weird word, but it's exactly what it is. I'm, in just a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. It's going to be very private. I try to make it private in a public place. And if you want to know more about what I just talked about, if you want to see it in the Bible yourself, if you'd like somebody to show you from the Bible how you can know, and I mean know, not just, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm an okay person. No, if you want to know without a shadow of a doubt that when you die, you're going to heaven, we would love to have somebody show you. You say, well, I could never do that. Well, it's, we, we, we'll take you to one of these offices. We'll make it private. If you're a man, we'll have a man help you. If you want to come as a couple or as two women, we'll, we'll get somebody that you're comfortable with. If you already know somebody in the building that you're comfortable with, go and ask them. Talk to them. And they, if they don't feel comfortable doing it, they will come with you to someone who is comfortable doing it. And we want, we want you to get this settled today. 
We want you to know when you leave that back door that if I died, if I, if I got hit by a car right here on 31, I'm going to heaven when I die. We would love for you to know that. If you are saved today, let me encourage you just real quick. Jesus is our example in all things. We're called Christians, and that word really means in the Greek, Christ, little Christs. Christ-like, that's what it means. So if you are not, the, if you don't have and you are not the kind of person that Jesus is described to be here, you are failing as a Christian. And you're probably the reason some people don't want anything to do with Christianity. Because they know a Christian who isn't loving, who isn't willing to help them, who isn't willing to go, who isn't willing to, to, to sacrifice, who isn't there in their time of need. But that is the way Jesus is described and that's the way we should be. Right. We ought to be spiritual first responders, if I could say it like that. To those that aren't saved today, I can't think of a better way to conclude this message than by inviting you to talk to somebody and see from the Bible how you can know. You say, well, what is, what's going to happen? They're just going to sit you down. They're going to show you from the Bible. Nobody's going to force you to make any decisions. Nobody's going to embarrass you. They're just going to show you what the Bible says and, and let you do what you want to do with that. And that's, that's our heart's desire today. Uh, and no matter what, you say, well, I, I'm not going to do it. We're glad you came today. We're glad you're here today. We're glad you heard the message. Let's go ahead and have a time of invitation. So all heads bowed and eyes closed, please. No one looking around. No one talking. I want it to be private. Be respectful of other people's